Thanks for joining us, and welcome to the Reptile Living Room, featuring John Taylor of Herp House Magazine and James Tintle with Cold-Blooded Publishing. The Reptile Living Room is brought to you by Herp House Magazine, the premier digital magazine for the reptile hobbyist, and by Cold-Blooded Publishing, your exclusive reptile media publishing company. Now, here are John and James in the Reptile Living Room. Good evening, and welcome to another broadcast of the Reptile Living Room. We're the only independently produced and distributed live reptile broadcast available today. Each week, we bring you a specific panel of herpetocultural and herpetological respondents to discuss the various aspects of our community and current events impacting and affecting herpetoculture and herpetology. Reptile Living Room also brings modern-day technology to our community through an interactive platform. Interact with our hosts, guests, and other like-minded individuals on Reptile Living Room YouTube channel live during the show. You can also interact with us on Google Plus and see some various aspects that we're actually adding into the show. I'm your host, James Tentel, Cold-Blooded Publishing and Tremendous Tricolors, and here is my co-host, John Taylor of Herp House Magazine and Reptile Apartment Group. How you doing tonight, John? Good afternoon, sir. How are you? <laughs> afternoon. Are you out there in? Uh, well, Hawaii? afternoon, evening. I don't know. It's you know, some point in the day. I'm here. <laughs> it's always morning somewhere, right? That's it. It's always five o'clock at at some point. <laughs> exactly. So, how's the day treating you today? Actually, pretty good. Today's definitely been a pretty good day. I, good I've deal. got some some stuff accomplished, and uh, looking forward to tomorrow. Awesome. Very cool. So, uh, who do we got for uh, sponsorships? You want to do sponsorships first, or who are we doing first? Yeah, sure. Actually, I want to um, take one of our sponsors, Natalie Bieto, Wildlife Illustrator. Um, she actually changed her website, so she's now going at www.reptilearts.com. So, Natalie, thanks for supporting this show, and hopefully, we can drive traffic to your new site. Looks pretty good. So, that's once again, that's Reptile Arts. Dot com. Go and visit Natalyn over there, and Natalyn has provided us with a gift to give our audience tonight as well. Nice, very cool. And I actually have one of those gifts that, uh, or that gift that uh, she is giving away tonight. Uh, we have one of those here at the house. So, very cool gift, must say. But you guys are gonna have to wait to see what it is because we're not gonna show you yet. Um, and tonight is all about the herpeticulture societies and what they're doing, why you should belong to one. Um, just basically, you know, regular reptile living room panel discussion of uh, different topics that affect the uh, herp societies, what they do, how they do it, why they do it. And on tonight's guest panel we have, um, we're going to start out with Kat Kyle of Southern Nevada Herpological Society. Then we have Ryan McVeigh from Madison Herpological Society and Jason Hood, former president of Chicago Herb Society. And then we have Chris Law of Central Florida Roaming Reptiles. And uh, we'll get into their bios and things after uh, we talk about the sponsorships and uh, who all sponsors the Reptile Living Room. And I'll let James go ahead and take care of that part of it. Oh, now you caught me by surprise. I was doing something else. <laughs> sponsors for Reptile Living Room. So we have we have another artist on our panel of sponsors, and that's Rachel Winchin of Happy Gecko Sticky Situation. Um, she provides some really good stickers, and uh, if you're looking for any kind of artwork, please visit her over there. Um, we also have Reptiles Express, your discounted FedEx uh, reptile shipper. Um, contact Debbie at reptilesexpress.com. Great company to work for and sh uh, ship your companies or ship your snakes through their company. I can't talk today. You would think it was Monday morning. Okay. No then, then we have Digital Aquatics. They actually have the Herp Keeper. Um, vis visit Digital Aquatics. If you're watching us on G Plus, you should be able to scroll through and see our sponsors and links to them. So check this side or this side. It's probably this side. Um, <laughs> 
if you're watching this on G+, if you're not, go over to G+, Reptile Living Room, and uh, you can see all the links to it in the show sponsors. Then we have a Canadian company that actually sponsors us. That's over in your hometown and uh, country there, John. The Dragon yeah. Lair. So. Really a great <laughs> bunch of people out there doing a lot of killer stuff. Um, lots of products for the Canadian herb, uh, herb uh, keepers out there, as well as the amphibian keepers. Uh, drop by the Dragon Lair. Uh, they also have uh, some new species coming in that are potentially going to be released later on. Uh, just a really great bunch of folks over there really doing a lot of uh, awesome deals for any herb keeper needs in Canada. Definitely stop, button, uh, stop over at the Dragon Lair. And then I got to say that I think this is your probably one of your favorite sponsors is the uh, Tempo with the uh, Blue Maestro device. Or, sorry, Blue Maestro with the Tempo device. <laughs> so I still have to set up my new one. I still have yet to do that. Jeez. And then, of course, we have the Reptile Apartment, uh, which just released a uh, monkey business about the uh, monkey that took a selfie with yeah, the camera. That, that, that's a crazy article. I, I thought it was pretty funny, and uh, it, it's really interesting to see um, photographer and how they actually gave that picture away for free and how much money is he's lost. It could really change the copyright laws here in the U.S., essentially. So definitely going to follow that. And we just talked about copyrights and things like that in our last show with the, uh, with the photographers as well as on the social media uh, show that we did, the social media sideshow. Absolutely. Yeah, we did. And uh, we didn't have a show last week. We're sorry for our audience on that. But the week prior, we did. We had a... Uh, um, talked about all the copyright on uh, photographs, too, as well. And then, of course, our other, our, uh, one of our other main sponsors is, uh, of course, Tremendous Strike Colors. So, Jimmy, uh, anything hatch out this week? <laughs> Seems like you, every week I call you, you're hatching out something else that's new and cool. Yeah, I'm just so <laughs> packed up right at the moment. I mean, it, it's taking every minute just to feed all the animals, all the babies. I don't even have time for pictures to get stuff up, stuff hatching. Um Actually, this week, I didn't have anything hatched this week. Um, next week, I have like four or five clutches to do. So it's nice. one of those, yeah, I'm getting towards the end because I only single clutched everything this year. So it's going to be hit or miss between the middle of August till about the middle of October. It'll be hit or miss. I'll have maybe one or two clutches, you know, every other week or every seven days. But um, I got over 400 babies that I'm feeding right now. So, Oh, man. That's rough. And uh, now you're uh, letting go of some of those extremes that you just uh, brought out, right? Yeah. Uh, the Honduran Milk Snake Extreme Hypos, uh, they will be for sale. I finally got those eating. Um, I'll be putting up another pair and some single males and single females, I think, um, up online tomorrow. So hopefully I'll get those up online tomorrow. Very cool. And a quick shout-out to Tammy uh, via the Dragon Lair, actually. Uh, Tammy is a journalist over at the Eastern Ontario News Network, and she does the uh, pet side. And I apologize, I don't remember the name of the column off the top of my head right now. Uh, but she's actually uh, picked up our show and uh, might be watching. Uh, she's going to be reporting on the show tomorrow uh, or sometime later in the week, I think in regards to the Herb Societies and what uh, what we're covering here in tonight's topic. So thank you for picking that up, uh, Tammy. Greatly uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, any other shout-outs that we have, Jimmy? No, I think it covers uh, – actually, we have one more, Rob Williams. And I, I, I have to get his website up on there. Rob, I know you're watching, and I'm really sorry. I have to get your website and everything up. Rob Williams did our voiceover for our intro He's done John's commercial for Herb House Magazine. He's done my commercial for the Guide to Hunter and Milk Snakes. If you want some sort of voiceover done or you're looking to build a commercial or a radio commercial or something like that, contact Rob Williams. I'll get his information up on Reptile Living Room Facebook fan page, and also you'll be able to see it in the description. So I'll get that taken care of here probably tomorrow morning as well. Awesome. Sounds good. All right, so jumping into our show tonight, um, like I said, we're going to talk to uh, Herb Societies, uh, presidents, vice presidents, uh, various other members of the boards, um, 
like we were talking about, uh, Kat Kyle is uh, one of our guests. She's the vice president of Southern Nevada Herpological Society. Uh, Southern Nevada Herpological Society has general meetings at the UNLV Co-op, 8050 Paradise Road, Suite 100. Uh, if you're in the Las Vegas area, they meet on the first Friday of every month, and they are dedicated to the education of its members and the public in regards to the conservation, ecology, and captive care, and breeding of reptiles and amphibians. Uh, definitely check them out. They're gonna, we're going to link everybody's uh, herb societies in the show notes at the end of the show. So we'll be able to click on those and find them uh, relatively easily. They're then, actually, they're actually, if you're, they're watching us on Google Plus, they're actually there in the showcase on Google Plus too. So they oh, can nice. actually link through there, just like our show sponsors. You have the showcase, so you can actually link to the Herb Society's home pages right now. Very cool. Thank you, Jimmy. And uh, next up, we have Ryan McVeigh, the president of Madison Herpetological Society. And big shout out to Ryan. That guy is just insanely passionate about herpeticulture societies and getting the full benefit out of herb societies and the whole nine. And that's just my personal opinion from personal experience that I've had dealing with Ryan. Um, like I said, he is the president of the Madison Herb Society. They meet at the Westward Westwood, sorry, Christian Church at 5210 Odana Road in Madison. Uh, they hold two-hour meetings every month, uh, consist of current events and updates within the Madison Area Herpological Society, and an open discussion topic, uh, topics ranging from proper cleaning procedures to current public events. And then during their second hour, they may have a guest speaker, or they have a guest speaker, sorry. So if you're living in the Madison Area, definitely drop by, say hi to Ryan and his uh, friends and colleagues out there. And then we're on to Jason Hood, the former president of Chicago Herpological Society, which was formed to educate the general public about reptiles, promote conservation of all wildlife, especially reptiles and amphibians, to encourage cooperation between amateur and professional herpetologists towards a broader and deeper knowledge of this fascinating field. And CHS holds meetings at the Peggy Notebart uh, Nature Museum, a uh, beautiful new building in Fulton Parkway and Cannon Drive, directly across from Fullerton from the Lincoln Park Zoo. And meetings are free and open to the public. Meeting deeds are the last Wednesday of each month. So definitely drop by and check them out. And we have also a longtime tribe member, Chris Law. Uh, he is the owner and curator of Central Florida Roaming Reptiles. Central Florida Roaming Reptiles is a public uh, educational outreach program that regards both native and exotic reptiles and amphibians. CFRR offers educational programs at birthday parties, nature centers, daycare centers, schools, and libraries. And even though uh, Central Florida Roaming Reptiles is not a herb society, they are a key player in the reptile outreach program. So if you live in the Central Florida area and would like to have CFRR come out to a birthday party or do an educational program, they can be contacted right there at uh, roamingreptilesofcf.com. And they also, of course, uh, most of the reptile societies and guests have Facebook pages, which are all linked as well in the uh, showcase, as well as the show notes. All right, I think I've covered everybody, except we once again left out Chad. Yeah, and then we have our executive <laughs> producer that uh, all of a sudden one of my guests wanted to get paid when I told him... Uh, my executive producer <laughs> would contact them. So, <laughs> how you get doing, Chad? Pretty good. And all I got to say is get in line. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants Chad to pay him up. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, so, Chad, God. you got a, you actually got a shout a shout out today, don't you? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, you talking about the auctions? Yep. Okay. The um. Uh, R A A C A auctions. What is it? Um, reptile and amphibian uh, charity yep. auctions. Reptile and amphibian charity auctions are, uh, started yesterday. They're going through. What's the date they're going through? Um, the tenth. The tenth. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a good cause. Check them out. Uh, the link will be up, um, and I'll be donating probably for the next one. It's actually in the showcase now, so you guys can see the link in the showcase as well. I have the link showcase there, along with all the um, 
herpetological societies that we have on the panel tonight. Yeah, you kind of caught me. I was actually on the other screen when I was looking at it when I heard my name. So, <laughs> so if uh, anybody wants to know, we've had questions. I've had questions about um, what Chad actually does. And, and Chad's a key player for John and I. For one, he, he is the mule of everything that we do. So he contacts all the guests for us. Um, he makes sure that their, their video is set up, their quality of their audio is good. Hopefully the guests agree that Chad's a wonderful guy to deal with in the beginning. Um, but uh, So Chad's uh, you know, the mainstay of what John and I do. And here on the show, we're the hosts. If it wasn't for Chad, we wouldn't be able to put such a great panel together every week, week in and week out. And, and Chad's a great addition to the team. So I just want to answer that to everybody that wanted to know why Chad hides behind the screen. Um, <laughs> during, during the show, Chad is talking with us throughout the whole entire show. You guys just can't see it. But he's talking with John and I throughout the whole show, letting us know when you comment for us to answer, for one of our, our guests to answer, or for John and I to answer. So that's what Chad does. If it wasn't for Chad, we wouldn't be able to do all that. So everybody give Chad a round of applause tonight, and, and we'll thank him. Definitely. Well, thank Definitely you very much. Time, Chad. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, John. So all right. I think we tackled everything now. Now we can get into the, the meat and potatoes of the show. So exactly. Exactly. Now, um, we're just going to basically do it like we always do, uh, talk to each individual guest as we can. And uh, we're going to start off with basically why are herpetological societies important not only to the hobby but to the general public? Now, what's your take on that, uh, Jimmy, as far as, you know, what's, what's important to you about a herp society as a member? Well, it brings, you know, herp societies, of course, bring like-minded adults and, and kids alike together. Um, so if you have a passion about reptiles, years ago, the first thing you would do was find a local herp society. Nowadays, the first thing most young kids do is find the local group on Facebook or <laughs> find the local group on uh, Tumblr or, you know, Twitter whatever it may whatever be. Whatever social network, yeah. Absolutely. So, um they're an important role for the hobby because I am a hobbyist. So they're very important to me for that because it brings me to that personal level of networking and working with people in the area and helping issues that are within my general area that we tend to overlook because of um, the Internet. So um, I'm always, you know, that's a big part there. What about you, John? I mean... You know, for me, honestly, like you, you know, the Herb Society was the first place I got my start. Um, a colleague of mine hired me on for some odd reason at a pet shop uh, as a fish keeper. I don't uh, understand why somebody would do such a thing, but... I, I don't know either. You know, he, <laughs> he took that shot and uh, hired me on as a fish keeper and then proceeded to tell me that I was also going to be feeding the reptiles. Now, I had never kept a reptile in my life, so I had no knowledge of reptiles whatsoever. And, of course, at the time, he was the uh, one of the board members of the local Herb Society, which was the San Diego Herpological Society at the time. And uh, he just handed me the newsletter and said, okay, join this, go read this, then you can start taking care of snakes and working here. I went to my first meeting, and I was hooked. I mean, here was these people talking about reptiles and amphibians and invertebrates and it seemed like the whole room was just like uh, almost an encyclopedia of knowledge and it ranged from just like myself a beginner all the way up to people that have been doing this stuff for 50, 60 years and you could walk up to them and just say hey I got a question about you know this snake not eating and they would sit down and take the time with you to walk you through processes that they learned. And you don't get that kind of personal, in-depth response that you do, um, or that you would get from, like, the Internet. It's not that personal, hands-on response by any means to me. So that's why I think they're important. And not only that, a lot of them do public outreach and public education. Uh, Ryan, I know, is huge on that. Um, and it's not always about the reptiles either. Ryan will hold a bowling event just to get people together and have fun 
and talk about reptiles. There won't be any there, but you can talk about them and just have fun. So to me, you know, herpetological societies are definitely one of the mainstays for herpeticulture, period. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they help out with general public, too. Um, I'm sure some of our panelists have non-reptile keepers in involved in our herpetological society or had, has mm -hmm. had, or at one time had somebody come to them. So um, it, we'll get into all these questions. But first, let's get into um, asking Ryan what his um, feelings are about herpetological societies in herpetoculture and the general public. Ryan, what's your thoughts on that? Why are they so important? My biggest thing with, uh, with what we do and, and I think what a herp society brings uh, to a community and to a group is, is more of the public outreach aspect of it. It's, it's, it's one, it's what I enjoy the most, um, and, and I think, it, too, it's where the Herp Society has a deep, its deepest impact. Um, when there's things like reptile shows, I mean, that's about the most public reptile thing, other than seeing reptiles at a zoo, um, and those are really directed generally at people that kind of are in the hobby already and already know about that kind of stuff. Um, the, most, the majority of stuff we focus on is getting out to the public, getting out to events, getting... Uh, in front of kids with reptiles and amphibians, changing people's minds on them and educating them on uh, the reality of what these animals are like. Uh, I can tell you countless stories of people that, you know, a woman that would come up to me uh, a couple weekends ago and she told me that every time she saw a snake in her garden, she'd hit it with a shovel and was scared out of her mind. Um, and then she told me she called animal control once and they showed up and told her it was a seven-foot venomous corn snake that was in her yard. So that, so she was scared. Yeah, seven foot venomous corn snake. So, so she, obviously she was scared of every animal that she came across. I had to tell her there's nothing venomous within 300 miles of her, unless she, and <coughs> even if there is, she's really got to be looking for it. Um, you know, but after talking to her for a while, she got really excited, took all my information, and now anytime she sees one, she sends me a test text and asks me what it is, and then goes and shows. <laughs> You know, so that's the kind of things that I think we do that are, are important. Um, there's other aspects, like the, the community building aspect of it, and it's funny we hear a lot of people talk about, like, the, the reptile community. Um, I don't really see us, the, the hobby is a community anymore, unfortunately. Um, communities help each other out. They're there for each other. It's a group of people that not only have a common interest but have common goals and direction. And unfortunately, I don't think that that's exactly where we're at in our hobby. Um, but but when you meet in person and you bring your local people together to actually work in the same direction and, and come up with the same goals and the same mission, um, it, it, I think that's another big important part. Because like you said, you can jump on any Facebook group and you can ask any question, but you don't know if that guy that's talking to you has ever even seen the reptile you're asking about let alone kept it, cared for it, bred it, versus in person you get a better connection with people. You really get more of a personal connection with people, and I think you build a lot more long-term relationships, and I think those are some of the bigger things that I think I really love about Herb Society. Definitely agree with you there. <laughs> Definitely agree with everything you said, for sure. Now, um, Kat, as far as you're concerned, what would you say is uh, the biggest importance of Herb Societies out there today? Well, us in Vegas, we don't have a real big or strong reptile community here. So for me, it's that we do have our meetings now. And it's every once in a while because we, we interact in the forum so much is that we can go, oh, yeah, well, this person's in the Herp Society and connect them with this other person. And they didn't know that they breed corn snakes. And go, hey, yeah, why don't you come to the meeting and meet them because we offer our first meeting for free. And then I'll get them interested to go, oh, yeah, well, this was fun. And I'll get them to join. But like me and Kim, we have the general meetings every month. Mm -hmm. And then in between those, we have kids' meetings. So it gets the kids interested to come up also, which is actually helps join our membership and get them stronger and get kids more involved in coming to our meetings also. And that's our favorite meetings to do is the kids' meeting because the kids ask so much more and want to get more interactive and everything, too. 
for right. sure. That's become a lot more of our favorite meetings to do is the kids' meetings as opposed to the adult meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Sit and listen, and they they ask more legitimate questions, or the adults are kind of like, okay. The yeah. kids want to touch everything and get more interested and get more interactive than it seems than the adults do. Right. They're very hungry for knowledge. Yes. Very cool. All right. And turning it over to Jason Hood, sir, what would you say is the uh, most important aspects of uh, Herb Society today? Uh, everything that the, these other two guys touched on, uh, getting out and talking to the community. Uh, Chicago has the the benefit negative correlation of a lot of the stuff gets in the news that happens around. So like when we had the alligator show up at uh, O'Hare Airport, I got interviewed by, I don't know, probably 30 different uh, <laughs> newspapers. And one of my, uh, a guy used to live in the area who moved back to Germany actually got the story in German that he was supposed to ship back to me. I never get to see it, but he's going to ship me the German newspaper with my name in it that, uh, you know, they talked about. So it, it was good. Anyways, it was good to get uh, um, the right spin on the stories and trying to right. talk. So we, we have a pretty good relationship with most of the media around Chicago because we're, we try so hard to get on the different channels for to promote our big reptile show every year. Mm -hmm. So we always leave cards and numbers for him to call us to try to get that Instead of letting the U.S. Humane Society put their spin on every story, we try to get in there and get our spin on the stories ahead of time. And then also just to, um, we just started the Junior Herb Society, and that's actually gotten to be a bigger meeting than our regular Herb Society. We're actually having two separate meetings, and um, that's been amazing. I, I really uh, love that. I'm in, and now that I'm down here in Florida, I'm thinking of trying to start a Junior Herb Society down here where I can uh, try to get some of these kids down here. It, basically, I think I, we everybody would probably say the same thing, that kids are more open-minded, and you can you can get a group of 30 kids together, and whether they all love or hate snakes, you can talk them into loving snakes by the time they walk out of the building. You get 30 adults together, you might change one or two attitudes, but for the most part, their mind's set, and they know what they know, whether they know anything or not. So sure. it, it's kids that just seem like a much better outlet for your for my energy at least you, you get a lot more positivity out of it and then um, as Kat was saying some of the kids are just so into the whole reptile world they're just creepy smart where they know <laughs> stuff um, that you would never think they would know or we had uh, I mean I've told the story probably 300 times now but it's just, just a cute cool story but we had a a uh, vet come in and he was doing really cool um, x-rays of animals and asking the kids to identify them. And he had just gotten into his role of doing the talk and glanced over his shoulder at an x-ray, knew what was coming up next, but he had switched slides. So in his mind, he had a caiman up there. So he says, okay, what, what's this, guys? And uh, the kids are looking at it and first kid goes, it's a gecko. And he's like, no, uh, no, 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 it's not a gecko. And then, you know, but that's close. It's it's kind of similar. And the next he goes, no, that's a gecko. He goes, no. And then another kid, out of the blue, if an x-ray goes, that's a uroplatus. <laughs> oh, like, my gosh. And it's to get, then the, the vet's like, <laughs> no, it's not a uroplatus. And he turns around and looks at it and he goes, oh, yeah, no, it is a uroplatus. You're right. Oh. How did you know it's a uroplatus? It's like, oh, just the shape and the eyes. It, it had to be a uroplatus. Is the size of the eyes and the shape of the face and everything on the skull. Wow. And he's like, yeah, I think you're right. I think it was. <laughs> and it just to, to have kids that are that into stuff, to me, is just amazing. And like like Kat said, they're just much more reactive and interested in what's going on. But to, we, the Herb Societies need to be out there. And our, our regular meeting, we have some of the best speakers come in, and I don't know why but the last couple few years the attendance has been going down like we have Colette Adams coming in to do a talk this month for the CHS and she doesn't do very many talks and she's an excellent speaker and she's going to come in and talk about Philippine crocodile conservation so it's a cool talk wow. you're definitely going to learn something and she's just one of those 
uh, zookeepers that have been around forever and knows everything about everything. It'd be awesome to just be in a room with her and talk to her. Yeah, it's pretty sure we'll get our usual thirty people. That, that 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 should be a talk that should be pulling in a hundred plus people. And this people don't because of the internet they don't they don't come out to the meetings anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. There's definitely a distance uh, incurred when we start working uh, via the internet, and everybody's an internet expert, and you know we don't need to read books anymore, or anything. Jason. Do you really think that it is a uh, internet-based reason why they don't come out, or is it more of <clears throat> our way of life in the U.S. nowadays is so busy, and you know, being between the 28 to 35 year old or 40 year old range, we typically have kids, uh, football practice, cheerleading, stuff like that. Does that kind of play a role in, in minimizing that? Uh, area of people showing up. Um, I I think it's a lot to do with the internet because uh, while we had a actual web page with a, a forum, a group prior to Facebook blowing up quite as huge as it had been, as it has been now, um, our our web based forum was very very active and we had a ton of people come in but we kept getting viruses into the system and kicking out into our email system and everything else so we took it down for that reason but the corresponding attendance also of our meetings it wasn't immediate but it was fairly quickly after that drop so the my point being that there the people are there people have the ability to make it out we saw it we were getting 70 to 90 people showing up at some of the meetings right but unless there's a constant reminder in their face all the time, they're just not coming out. There's too many other distractions. And the I think the general U.S. attention span has gotten down to around 10 minutes now. People just don't they don't pay attention to what's going on around them. They don't know what's happening. I mean, we see it with the trying to fight the laws. We see it with everything else. The If it's not a constant thing, people don't pay attention. And unfortunately, it happens with our meetings as well. We don't people are like, oh, I wanted to come to that. That would have been a great spot, a great uh, talk to see, and they just don't come out. Right. Okay. It was just a question that I, I figured I'd ask, um, being that you know that father that has two kids, and you know, time it is of of the essence. And one of the reasons I don't make it out to a lot of them is, you know cheerleading practice, school, school functions, they just land on the days that the meetings are and you know so I, I just wanted to see if you saw any correlation between that. So let's jump over to Chris even though Chris doesn't run a herpetological society Chris Law, you work with a lot of children and doing the public outreach side um, what, what's the most important part of her, you know, herpetological societies or actually public outreach programs like yourself? Well, I have to say, and I'm glad you asked that question, mainly because um, today was a very good example of that. Um, I did a daycare center earlier today, and this is my second show at this particular location, and uh, all the kids were really excited the first time around, so they wanted to have me out the next time. So and there was uh, a different group of kids that I did the show for this time, and, and uh, this was a slightly younger group. One of these kids especially was absolutely petrified of pretty much everything reptilian. Uh, he was sitting on the lap of one of the teachers at the school, and he did not want to come anywhere near these animals at all whatsoever. He literally was shaking and trembling and crying uh, just at the sight of them. They did move him away just you know, to try to calm him down some, but towards the end of that show, he finally did come around, and he finally actually touched and held a snake. And to me, there's n no greater feeling in the world of accomplishment than when you – take a kid that was just so deathly afraid of that animal and then you get to see them gradually progress where they're no longer there you know they start to become interested and then they start breaking that fear uh, reasonably well enough that they're willing to come a little bit closer and maybe get a closer look and then actually graduate to the point that they're like okay I'll go ahead and try it I'll, I'll pet it and then even hold one and herp societies if 
especially when they're operated well. Uh, and I'm glad you guys have Jason Hood on here uh, because I, if you guys didn't, I would have definitely recommended it. I really admired everything that he and others had done with the uh, Chicago Herpetological Society, some of their uh, programs and events that they held. And I would really like to see that happen more across the U.S. and try to get people more involved. It opens up doors and allows them to see something different. And um, also one of the things that I uh, saw at this show that I did today was um, they had decided to get a bearded dragon in their classroom. They originally didn't have any pets in the classroom, but after I did my first show and they saw how many of the kids were actually really did enjoy it and really learned a lot, they decided that they wanted to get a classroom pet that the kids could learn about and watch and observe. So they did. They contacted me and they asked me some questions about what I would recommend. And I told them, I gave them a few um, options. A bearded dragon was one of them. So they did go and purchase a, uh, a bearded dragon and they set it up. Uh, they uh, used a lot of my recommendations for its housing and set him up really nice. So the kids are, you know, pretty fascinated with the animal and they got to learn a lot more about different other animals today. So us being able to get out there, it doesn't matter whether you do it as a job or whether you do it uh, just as a, a hobby or whether or not we're getting together as a herp society. Trying to provide outlets for people to learn the truth about these animals is, is just paramount to herpeticulture for conservation. And we really need that. We And it doesn't matter whether it's just a small herb society that's local or whether it's a larger one that uh, has a lot of great speakers like the CHS has done. Um, I think if we tried to work together and try to build up um, more connections um, gradually across the U.S. and start opening up a lot more herb societies, even if they're smaller ones, uh, they could go a long way. Very cool stuff, man. Jeez. Now, um, as far as the herb societies and how they've evolved over the years, what's everybody's take on, you know, how much have they changed since the uh, early days of herb societies? Do you see any major changes, or is it pretty much just a steady growth in uh, membership or anything like that? Uh, I guess we can start off with uh, let's start with Jason Hood. Do you see any changes over the years in the herb societies at all so far? Um, well, I was only up at, with the CHS for 10 years, but the 10 years prior to me getting there, they went from, uh, I think it was 2,400 members down to when I started with uh, CHS, they were around 800 members. Uh, when I left, they 10 years later, uh, we were down at, I mean, I'm still the vice president, but I'm down here in Florida. So, but yeah. um, there we're somewhere between I think 470 to 500 members right now, which is still excellent for this modern day and age. But uh, that was going back 10 years, and then another 10 years, you're you're looking at huge jumps in the internet and the activity and type of activity on the internet. And that's another reason I think that people, the Internet's a huge reason for the decline of the herb societies on a whole. Um, and most herb societies have seen the same thing, where the, their membership has declined. For the simple fact that you had to go to be in a room with people to talk about reptiles. You had to do that. There was no other option unless you called up somebody and you were talking to them on the phone. Now you, we can do this. We can have Facebook conversations and go into six different forums and start start fights and arguments and, you know, all the things reptile people love to do. And uh, it, I, we've seen a decline because of that. And I think it's, it's – we're going to get to a point where um, you're not going to have – I think like as you were saying, you're not going to have the opportunity to learn as much online as you will in person, and people are going to start kind of catching that again. Hopefully we're seeing like the bottom end of this decline of people – not going out to these things, and we're hopefully we'll start seeing an increase as people realize going in to see a, a speaker at a herb society meeting that's a the class you know class A speaker is you with CHS we we have our 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 meetings and afterwards we go out to dinner and some of the dinners I've learned more at the dinners sitting around drinking beer eating pizza and just chatting with somebody on a one to one level asking a couple of questions to follow up what they talked about during the meeting or not even what they talked about, but, you know, oh, by the way, you were in Peru. What did you see? You know, what do you think about this? And they come back with some answers, and you're just like, 
oh my god, you know, I, I would never learn this anyplace else. Exactly, exactly. Per, personal experience cannot, re, you know, the internet will never replace personal experiences. It's just impossible. Well, it's hard to type out a whole conversation like you can in person, and unless you know these people personally, and um, the CHS is just ridiculously lucky that they've had such a long standing reputation as being one of the top herb societies as I this year's vice president and the previous four years I ran the vice president position my only job was to get speakers and we would I would just call up people I'd be like I want to see that person so yeah. let me call them <laughs> and every person for the most part says yeah absolutely CHS sure I'll be there and like not like we're paying them we, we don't we don't cost them anything but time but we don't pay them and they were all happy to come out and do talks. So we got some of the greatest speakers, or at least that I could think of, with the exception of maybe uh, I tried Dick Bartlett, and he just says, I'm too old. If I'm traveling, I'm going to Peru, and that's it. So if it's not Peru, it's Florida. If you guys want to come down here, that's fine, but I'm not traveling. Uh, other than him and maybe two other people, everybody else I've ever asked said yes. So we're really spoiled in that regard. Plus we have a decent budget to work with so we can fly people in. So um, we, we've been very lucky with our speakers, but we still, no one, we have a huge herb community in Chicago, but no one comes out to the meetings. I mean, no one. We, we get 30 to 50 people, but it, 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 there should be way, way more. Yeah, for sure. People just don't come out for it. Right. And Kat, what's your feeling on that? Um, how do you see the herb societies evolving over the years? Like I said, I've only been in it for the last couple of years. <laughs> I've worked my way up, sadly, with Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling John before the show, um, I've only been um, in the Las Vegas Herp Society the last year. <laughs> I'm a vice president now. But we don't have a strong showing, and I'm just a bookworm and read and do this and that, and we'll do anything and work with people really well. and. Well, Kim and kind of dragged me and said, "Hey, come to the board meeting and you'll work your way up. Trust me." And well, look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is—it's a struggle. And like um, you were saying, we don't have a strong membership. Our membership, I think, sitting right around 350, which is a good for us. But every meeting, okay, is. Um, we get between 30 and 50 people a meeting. This is our 20th year for us, so we're trying to make it a strong year and go and fight. But we use um, the social media outlets as much as we can to help us with um, getting our memberships up because I'm active and we have like five or six Facebook forums in Vegas, which is a lot for not having a big... Um, biggest crowd, but we have one just for arachnids, and then we have one that's for reptiles and for dogs and cats and birds, and then we have like four just reptile ones. Um, but I'm active on each one of those, and we'll talk to people, and then I throw all of our announcements for, hey, we're having a meeting, why don't you come and show up, and this and that. And when people ask, oh, hey, did and they'll ask about a certain thing. I'll be like, oh, yeah, well, we learned about it last month. And if someone will throw incorrect knowledge up, I'll be like, no, no, no. Our speaker last month, so-and-so, said this is the correct way to do it. I will right. use that as an example to try and push, hey, look, this is correct knowledge, and this is where we learned it. Right. To now, do you see a large hey, increase uh, with uh, being that active in social media? Do you think you've seen an increase in the past couple of years that you've been on board as far as activity within even just the current membership? Um, yes and no. I can't really say because I don't always have access to the membership list. I just sure. got access to it. Right, right. Understandable. All right. Now, I just uh, took over vice president like a month ago. Uh, lucky you. <laughs> I was just on the advisory board and then just stepped up because unfortunately our old vice president got too busy with personal stuff. Ah, uh, yes. That happens. 
I, I'm sure I'm sure Ryan and Jason would be glad to help you out in that position if you ever had a, a question that Kim and Ken couldn't answer. I'm sure our other panelists will have no problem helping you out in that, that sense. I would love any advice or anything. They'll probably say don't take it, but <laughs> <other than that. laughs> So, all right. Well, congratulations on, on your vice presidency of uh, the Herpetological Society, and uh, Thank you. let's get let's grab to you because you are um, a Facebook fanatic. I, I see you on Facebook all the time posting <laughs> stuff. I wouldn't say you're dedicated totally to Facebook because I know you are working totally on various other projects. But um, what have you seen? You know, what Madison Herpetological Society, how, how have you seen it actually react over these times of Internet in the past 10 years? Well, see, so here's the thing about uh, the Madison Area Herp Society is it's only four years. I started this four years ago. So it went from just an idea to where I'm at now, which is blows my mind every single time we go do an event, how many people know who we are. Um, but... Uh, you know, when we started this, we kind of started it in the er in the era of social media and, and social media kind of running things, and membership kind of fluctuates. And and like I said, I mean, before is we've kind of focused, we've kind of focused on just getting out to the public, and you, we we start to see that the more events we do and the more getting out in front of people we do, the more we get people in. Um, it, it really depends on that. I mean, every meeting we do, I put stuff on Facebook, I put stuff on Twitter, I have stuff on, uh, man, my, my board creates events and invites every single person we know, you know, whether they live in Madison or I'm sure I've invited John. I don't think he's going to make it down from Canada, but, <laughs> but you know, you never know who's going to be in the area and want to come check something out. So, um, and then, uh, we, we put stuff on Craigslist. We put ads up saying there's going to be a meeting. Um, we try and get out to as many people as we can, but um, I do think, to an extent, uh, social media is kind of, and the Internet's kind of hurt herp societies, but I don't think it's just herp societies. It's any organization that deals with people one-on-one, -on -one. because, um, I mean, social media has kind of given everyone in the past five years this false sense of friendship and, and, and connection with people. Like, you, talk, you hear, you know, all the arguments in the reptile community or any community and they're talking about people like they know them, but they've never met them. They've just talked to them in a little box on a screen, um, you know, versus the the actual connections you get when you meet in person. And I think that's one thing we find that once people show up to a meeting, they and, and they and they actually sit and talk to us and sit, you know, our meetings get done at 10. I've left the parking lot at 3 in the morning, you know, because we just stood out there talking. And, and I think once people get around that, they instantly start coming back and they, you, you actually build friends, you know. Um, my kids know my vice president and most of my board members by name just because they come over and hang out all the time. We do cookouts. We, you know, we get together and, and we all actually are friends other than just being reptile people, you know, and I think that's one big thing that I tried to do when I started this was not just make an organization of people who like reptiles, but also who are going to hang out outside of that, who are going to, like John said, would do the bowling event just to hang out. You know, just, just kind of get people to kind of come together and actually form a community. And what that's done is any time that we have something like these bands come up where things need to go out to people, you know, or we want to sign petitions or we want to um, get people into a, a boardroom to fight a local ban, we get so many more people. Um, but it just kind of comes to the point where you kind of have to force yourself to be in front of people. And like Jason said, people's attention span is so short, and they want everything handed to them. And if you don't hand it to them and, and feed them with a little spoon, you, you don't grab them. And, and, and that's kind of part of it. We just force ourselves to be in front of people all the time. And that's why we're posting all the time and doing as much uh, articles and things as we can. So that people are seeing us so much that it just becomes a thing where they, it, you know, kind of like, you know, advertising ourselves, I guess, just to kind of make sure that, you know, like watching, you see a Coke commercial, 20 minutes later you want a Coke. So, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully next time somebody says, oh, I need to fight, feed my gecko, that looks just like the Madison Herb Society logo and I should check out when their next meeting is. So it's all subliminal. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> subliminal taking over the world. Right. <laughs> now, as far as, uh, and we're going to keep it with you, Ryan, if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think 
uh, from a herb society standpoint, what is wrong with actual herpeticulture today? Oh, man. If you had to pick one main topic, and we're going to get to all the rest of the guests, so don't feel like you're being put on the spot here because we're <laughs> going right. to ask everybody, so no one's getting free of this one. Oh, the problem with the herpes cultural community. You know what my biggest thing is, and I, I've started to change this myself, um, is people, when they get into any research, period, people don't research their animal before they get it. People don't research their animal when they have it. I know for a fact that there are people that breed ball pythons that don't know where they come from, other than Africa. I know that there's people who breed <laughs> leopard geckos that don't know where they come from because they put them on super dry sand with a 120 degree basking spot because they think they come from a desert. You know, and that's the biggest thing for me is I've started to really bring myself back and say, okay, I, I don't want to read a care sheet. I want to learn everything about where they come from and build my own care sheet. I don't want to, and I think that's something that people need to start going back to. Where, do they, where does your animal actually come from? What does it actually eat in the wild? Uh, how does it live its day? How, is it nocturnal or diurnal? If it's diurnal, how does it spend the day? Is it out basking? Is it hiding? Is it eating? Um, what does its habitat look like? Like bearded dragons, another good example. Everybody thinks they eat tons of greens. Find me a picture of the Australian desert that's full of green, <laughs> other than two months of the year. You know, so yeah, for two months of the year, they're going to chow down flowers and greens, and then it's all dead. That's it. So for people, so I've heard that their diet's 90% greens. That's not even possible where they come from. You know, so it's things like that that I think people really need to get back into is not just getting an animal to have it, but learning about it. You know, um, I mean, behind me, are, I, I'm in my kitchen. I've got nine, ten different dart frog tanks that I had to custom build based on where the animal, each frog comes from. Um, put them through seasons. I, I, I decided to start working with Mantellas. I downloaded and got some connections that gave me every scientific article written on Mantellas in the last 50 years. And half of them I have to translate from German. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I, I have so much information at my fingertips that I can really start to build how I need to care for these animals instead of just assuming that I can Google it really quick. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in my eyes is that people... Now you just want to, you have all this information, you have smartphones and you have, you have your internet and you can just Google something really fast and get a basic care sheet. And that's basic. I mean, that's what it takes to keep that animal from dying on you. But at the right. same time, I think we lose that idea of where does it actually come from? What is its habitat? What, what are the parameters of its, of, its, of its life really like? And how can we mimic that in captivity? Yeah, we've lost a lot of the natural history that we used to learn, you know, like you said, just from reading the books, whether, you know, because I get teased a lot about my books being outdated and stuff like that, and it's like, oh, they're outdated, all right, sure. But guess what? <laughs> it's gotten <laughs> to the point where... You'd never find in the newer books either. Right, it's getting to the point now where, you know, when I'm telling people to go to books to, to read instead of Google things, and I feel really backwards telling people to not go to the Internet. Yeah, exactly. You just never know. Is did that care sheet come from a guy that's bred that animal for the last forty years, right. or did it come from a guy who was like, "Well, I have a friend that needs one. I'll just do some research and throw it together." But I've never had one of these. Right. You know, and you just don't know anymore. And, and I know Jason can uh, agree with that one about fact checking. We were actually on <laughs> one of the Facebook groups. And he, he went in there and he was like, oh my, I can't believe it. I cannot uh, say what's wrong, but people, please fact check. And, and how do you fact check? You go to books, you go to publications, you go to, you know, uh, written material. That's how you fact check it. So I agree totally, and, and I'm sure most of the rest of the panel does too. Yeah, for sure. And as a matter of fact, let's talk to Chris. Chris, what do you think uh, is the problem with her pediculture today, sir? My list is rather long, <laughs> um, but you know what? Ryan hit it right on the head. Um, I mean, everything he said was very, very accurate, um, and, and I'd like to kind of go back to one of his points that he made about getting face-to-face -face with other people instead of you know everybody just looking on a screen and sending an instant message here and there. Uh, and that was probably one of the uh, biggest decisions that I made that really changed a lot in my life and how I related to other keepers. Um, and actually, one of the, my first uh, big reach out was um, 
driving seven and a half hours to go to a CHS meeting from Columbus, Ohio. I drove all the way out to Chicago, Illinois, so this way I could attend a uh, Brian Fry talk that they were hosting. Wow. And uh, that was where I got to finally meet Jason Hood, uh, Cindy Steinle, and several others, as well as Brian Fry. And I was glad I did that because I, I was able to put a, a face to a name. I was able to actually have a discussion, meet these people, have some fun, talk, laugh. And that built up some connections with people that I feel are, are great people. Uh, just a couple of nights ago, uh, Tim Cole from Austin Reptile Service, um, he is in um, Central Florida for the uh, TSA meeting. And, well, his, I should say his girlfriend is in here for the TSA meeting, and he, um, he wanted to do a little bit of herping. So, you know, I've never met him in person before, but he and I met up, and uh, I showed him around, and we went and did a little bit of herping. And so I got an opportunity to, you know, to spend some time with him, go out and do some herping and talk and, and learn about each other. And I'm glad I, got, I was able to do that. You know, it, a lot of people, they think that the Internet is, is the solution for everything nowadays. And don't get me wrong, it has a lot of great resources. But as Ryan hit, it, it's, not the, it, it's not the end all for it. You know, you do have to try to look beyond that. We do kind of have to go back to basics sometimes in order to really get the biggest bang for our buck. And as far as what I feel one of our biggest issues with um, herpetoculture is right now is um, obviously imports of a lot of unnecessary animals. Um, maybe some people might disagree with me on this, but I would really – it would not hurt me in the slightest if another ball python was never imported into this country, to be honest with you. Um, however, I did, see, I did do one thing. I, I shared a video uh, not too long ago. I didn't really like what they were doing in the video. They were, you know, they were going out and digging up ball pythons and removing eggs uh, from their burrows. But what I did, the reason I shared it was because very few people actually get to see how a ball python actually lives in the wild. And so it actually, now granted, most of the video is of somebody's jeans or their shirt, but for a brief moment you actually get to see some habitat, how they live. And uh, as Ryan had mentioned before, you know, people thinking that they live out in the middle of the desert or whatever. I did. I had one woman contact me uh, interested in a ball python, and she said, oh, yeah, but this is going to be my daughter's first snake. And we have we got a, a tank set up. All I need to do is go out and buy the sand, and it'll be ready to go. That was a big red flag that just went up. As soon as she said sand, I'm like, obviously, you didn't read the first damn thing about these snakes. And so I basically I sent her a, um, a link to a, a Dave Barker's guide on, on, on their care. And I said, look, you know, I can't stop you from getting this animal, and uh, but – you know, I'm saying I will not give you an animal, you know, personally until after I can see that you've researched this animal. Please review this at least and then let me know and we'll talk about it later. If you're still interested, we'll talk about it. But I don't feel comfortable, you know, uh, allowing you to take one of my animals until I know that this animal is going to be properly cared for. She was a little irate about it. Uh, and this is another problem is that a lot of people, they seem to feel that um, – they should not have to put forth that kind of effort that, that I should basically sit there and hand walk them through every little step. And you, you just can't do that. Um, you know, these people have to put in some effort for themselves and truly learn if they don't put in that effort, even if you give them a little bit of a care sheet or they read a few little factoids about the animal. Yeah, they might keep it from dying, but then that animal at, at no point is going to uh, thrive in that captive environment. And you want, we want, if those of us that are truly passionate about this community, well, I, you know, this, I'm putting community in quotes here, but, um, you know, it, it, we use that term rather loosely, to be honest. But yeah. um, for those of us who are truly passionate about these animals and really uh, want to see um, conservation and education continue to, to flourish, we want these people to actually reach out, try to learn, and we want them to have all the resources at their disposal to be able to make, make proper choices on what is a good pet for them, what's not a good pet, and for crying out loud, do some research to know how to enable this animal to thrive in your home. Uh, not just don't just do just enough so you know how to keep it from croaking on you in the next couple of months. And this is one of the biggest issues that I've seen in doing rescue in Ohio. I, I got just tons of animals that just were constantly flooding through the door, alligators out the wazoo, which just absolutely made me sick. 
Um, I got ball pythons, of course, came in, but thankfully most people did take fairly decent care of them. But um, at the same time, there's just so many of them out there nowadays, and they're a dime a dozen, and people can, you know, they buy them for really cheap, and they can dump them for really cheap. Um, so I would really like to, us to start working really hard at changing some of our policies. Uh, the breeders, um, you know, Ryan also hit that on the head as well. Um, some of the, the breeders themselves, ball pythons are so easy to breed. It really does not take much effort and much knowledge at all to breed them. And But yet that doesn't necessarily mean you have to know exactly where they come from. And, and it's sad to me when breeders of these snakes can't even give you some of the most general information that most people should be able to provide about these animals. And that to me is a red flag. And, you know, but then these are just the fly-by-night breeders, and these are the ones that's flooding the markets with a bunch of useless animals that, no, you know, that they can't get rid of or they're dumping for really cheap. And we want to try to steer away from that as much as we can, and the only way that we can do that is through education and outreach and trying to show people what is the appropriate way to be able to go into keeping reptiles and not just jumping into it with both feet, actually educating yourself, read, find resources, compare those resources, and ask yourself critical questions that, know, that enables you to know whether or not this animal is truly going to be better off in your home, or maybe you should consider a different species that you feel that you can provide more adequately for. Now, that was a, a very good ending to that question, Chris. And <laughs> I, I think all our panelists and, and the majority of uh, of us in uh, herpeticulture agree with you, um, and, and Ryan, and I'm sure Jason has the same the same answer. Um, Jason, is there anything you want to add in particular to to this discussion part? Wait, what was the question now? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with herpeticulture today? Yeah. Um, I'm no, sure the I, laundry I, list is almost as long as Chris's. Yeah, well, no, it it <coughs> the whole the Craigslisting and of all the animals. Uh, I was just my wife's been making jewelry, so I brought her up to this flea market swap thing to see if she thought she'd want to go sell there. And as we were walking around, a lady in this bird and in exotic pet store, or whatever they tried to call it, in this flea market. Uh, actually said that turtles only grow as big as the, the tank they're in. The lady said, she was trying to sell a uh, red ear, and she, the lady says, well, I have a 10-gallon tank at home. And she says, well, do you want it to get big? Because it'll grow big in a 10-gallon. If you take one of these the little turtle, plastic turtle pond things, it won't get big. And this was like the sixth, I think the sixth or seventh thing she had said that was completely false that I finally snapped on her. But, um... <laughs> I bit my tongue at least six times. Uh, I tried my best, but yeah, um, the general. I, I love that uh, I've learned so much geography, and learned of countries I never knew existed prior to looking at where certain reptiles came from. But I don't think many people, or not nearly as many people, do that as they should. Um, people know where Ghana is because. And then a couple other African countries, that's where the ball pythons come from, but they don't really know much of anything else. Yeah, this similar. Yeah, research and uh, mm -hmm. the biggest issue I see is that it's become so much about the money to so many people. That's just a painful thing to see to me. Uh, but but it, it, that's not new. Um Wholesalers been doing that for years. There's wholesalers that they import huge quantities of stuff, knowing that a huge quantity is going to die, so they can sell what's left over because they're getting such good prices out of them. Uh, and I remember going into one particular wholesaler years ago, probably 15 years ago, down here in Florida, who's probably the most prosecuted wholesaler. <laughs> It'd be the best way without giving their name. Um, and they had a guy who, from like 9 to 12, his job was to pick up dead animals. And he was busy every morning from 9 to 12 just picking up dead animals out of all of their bins. Um, they're also responsible for most of the exotic uh, findings here because the guys know to go to their around their neighborhood and go look for weird stuff. So it's... 
the, mm. the greed, the general greed that's always been in the, in the culture, uh, I got a problem with. I mean, I have animals that, that are higher end animals, and I like to see them stay there, not necessarily just for the money, but because the higher end, more obscure higher end stuff, um, you tend to get a better community of people. The, the black-headed python community that I've run into has been very, just a good group of people. They're, they tend to be very into the animals. They're not there for the money because it's really not any way to make money on them. And the, the obscure colubrid community, I, it's a great community. You get people who really, really love their animals. But when you get into the, the mass market, easy to breed stuff that is easy to sell, more importantly, because most everything's easy to breed, um, you get into a different culture of people, and they're they're there for the money, and that that just kind of irks me, and always has. All great points, uh, panelists. And great points, all of them. Uh, I can't agree any more. Going into our second hour, we actually have a trivia question, and Chad, if you could do your screen share um, now, if you can hear me, but uh, trivia question for tonight, and you're gonna win a bumper sticker. And it's the middle one here. It's I Love Animals More Than Humans. Um, it's created by Natalie Biedo. And the trivia question is, and you have to go to her G Plus event page. So find her G Plus event page. And you have to post, on, post the answer. So the question, what is the oldest and longest currently active herb society? So... Go to our G Plus face our, our G Plus page, Reptile Living Room. Post in the comment section, question and answers. What is the longest running Herp Society? And you'll win this great sticker in the middle, bumper sticker. I love animals more than humans. Thank you, Chad. All right. Hopefully everybody's going there right now and uh, putting in their answers. Chad, make sure you keep an eye on that so we can find a winner, okay? All right. All right, John. So in the second hour, what are we gonna what topics are we gonna cover now? Oh, we got the age old what's in it for me, uh, outings and trips, uh, herb societies working with the government, because we all know that, you know, herb societies are totally government conspiracists and, you know, trying to ban all of our snakes for us. And then uh, Publications that they put out, um, and then oh, the uh, sponsorships and how to sponsor a herb society and what what does that entail? If someone uh, say like you know Bill Gates was watching you know because everybody knows Bill Gates watches our show, so if Bill Gates wants to donate that ten million dollars to you know instead of going buying a piece of damn artwork, donate to a herb society, make a difference, you know. Come on, Bill, you know you're watching. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let's start with uh, what's in it for me. What do I get out of a herb society when I go to a herb meeting? Well, I actually I actually think we covered that. I mean, most of the guys on, and ladies on the panel already kind of covered that. I actually, and sorry to cut you off. No worries. But um, actually, I'd like to get into um, what you just mentioned. The outside sources coming in and supporting local herb societies or, you, you know, do we see that? Have our panelists seen that? I think that's great. Do we see, you know, local hardware stores, which really aren't local anymore because Home Depot took them over and so did Lowe's. But, you know, Ryan, let's start with you. Have you seen any kind of local outside business that aren't in the pet trade support your Herp Society? Oh, yeah. Um, it kind of, well, <laughs> the ones that are not part of, at all of any type of animal trade that have sponsored the Herp Society, um, basically are honestly more friends of mine. Um, I have a friend that owns a uh, really cool local sub shop, and he sponsored us just because we do a lot of stuff around town with them. Um, otherwise, the majority of the sponsors we have are vet, a vet um, pet stores, uh, Zilla, Zoomed, um, uh, just kind of stuff like that. Um, it's extremely difficult to get sponsors uh, it's I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about the benefits and begging <laughs> but uh, because running a nonprofit's super super awesome with a lot of money a lot of a lot of pennies to try and make this stuff happen 
Um, but, but, you know, for anybody watching, you know, we always open up ourselves to be sponsored by anyone. Um, and anything, and what we do in order to kind of help get people to want to be sponsor or want to be sponsors, other than just, you know, putting their name up on something once in a while, is once a week um, we pick a day and we share something about them on Facebook on our Facebook page. Um, so if the sub shop's having a, a sale, we'll on their day of the week we'll let people know. Or if they want to run something with us, like if you have a Herb Society membership card and you come get a meal, you get a free cookie. You know, we do stuff like that with them where it's specific to Herb Society members. So it brings people into their to their organization or into their business, um, and that's kind of, and that's kind of the things we do is we we try to represent the people and as much as we can and give them a reason to wanna uh, sponsor us. We also on the back of all of our pamphlets is a QR code that goes to the sponsorship page. So if you're sitting there and you're curious, and each one of the sponsorship logos goes to their website or Facebook page. Um, so we try and get them as much publicity as we can. Um, and I know for a fact, especially for the local vet, it's made a massive impact. I don't even have to ask them for their sponsorship money every year. I just I just message them the word hey and they say the checks in the mail. So um, you know, so it's it's been it's been pretty awesome, but it is difficult. It is difficult to get people to say, well why would they want to? And that's kind of a big part of why we had to offer up so much in order to make it worth it for them. But but yeah, we're open to any type of sponsorships, anybody that wants to help us out. And we have had people that didn't exactly sponsor us, um, but did donate a lot of stuff to help us out when we got started. Uh, there's a printing company locally that gives us good deals on our, our pamphlets and uh, printed, printed us off, off a free banner, which was pretty awesome. Um, you know, so stuff like that always comes around, but it is difficult to get people to sponsor. Right. Well, it's good to see some outside, like the sub shop and stuff like that, other outside companies outside of the pet trade. Um, Kat, what about you? I, I mean, I know you're pretty much just into the role of vice presidency, but have you seen sponsorships from outside sources, major corporations, local businesses, something, anything like that? Um, so far, we haven't. I've just recently brought up the idea to Kim that I see um, local breweries doing stuff with like the pit bull rescues and dog and cat rescues. So seeing if maybe we can start doing stuff with them where they'll give 1% or 2% of their proceeds of the night over to the rescues or to the foundation since living in Las Vegas, beer goes over great with people. So I want to see if maybe we can start doing something like that to have a beer sponsor a night because one of our local um, forums actually does do nights where we just go and meet and talk about... Um, bugs and arachnids and stuff like that, and it's just a fun night, but we want to see if we can get them to sponsor the Herp Society and get them to do something like that, because right now we have exotic pets and reptiles and reefs and Pet Kingdom do donations and zoo med, so I want to see if we can start doing a farther outreach. Interesting. I, I, that's a good way to look about it. I know local PTAs here in um, in Florida do the same thing pretty much. They have, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A day or something like that, and you go in and you give them a, a ticket and proceeds of all their sales for that night between a certain hour go right to the, the local PTA or the school PTA. Um, let's jump over to, to Jason. Jason, being in Chicago, I'm, you have some large businesses, a lot of major corporations that are based mm -hmm. out of there or at least have facilities there. Did you see any kind of, you know, a, a lot of those companies donating and promoting and helping out uh, Chicago Herp Society? Um, I don't know what was done in the past, but uh, as far as sponsors go, we did have um, one of the major uh, box pet stores sponsor our reptile fest show we do, but all of our proceeds that we run the entire society off of comes off of our once a year reptile fest event that Chris was talking about earlier. Uh, other than that, uh, it's just ZooMed, 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 ZooMed. And I don't think uh, ZooMed or, and Gary get enough appreciation from the reptile community for all they do with US Arc and sponsoring societies and sending out stuff. I mean, we have one of the coolest, greatest, most awesome raffles you can imagine. If you ever needed a, anything that ZooMed produces, they ship us a whole pallet full of stuff for our, 
uh, sponsoring our Reptile Fest event, and that's our raffle materials for the rest of the year. But our Reptile Fest event, we have in the the last few years prior to this one this year, where we had the first 80 plus degree day of the year Saturday and the second day over 80 on Sunday, which killed our attendance. No one wanted to come inside. Uh, the previous three years, we've been getting between five and 6,000 people through the door. So with the um, proceeds from that, we run the whole, the whole year's worth of activities, plus we do outreach to five to 6,000 families that are almost... It, it's one of those really odd things to me. We can't get um, reptile people to show up. And I know Ryan's been there, Chris has been there. Um, as far as a, a place where there's reptiles, it's like, to me, it's 10 times better than any reptile show you can go to because it's all hands on and it's people that are the actual keepers of these animals. No one's trying to sell anything, no sales are allowed. And you walk through there and you see stuff that you never see anywhere else. I mean, uh, one of the guys who was the first guy to breed, um, it's, he had sun gazers and the armadillo lizards. And I know one of them, he was the first guy to breed them. And the other one's never been bred in captivity. I think the armadillo lizards are the ones that he is the first to breed. But he has them just sitting there. You know, If you look at the number of animals he had there, it, it's probably because uh, one of them, I was told, is pretty darn expensive, like five grand an animal. So he, he brings you know, thirty five, forty thousand dollars in animals to sit there and let people walk by and look at them. Um, and then, I mean, the the other thing about the show is that we've got, you know, your ball python, your corn snake keepers that are there talking to the the, the, the general public doesn't care. They don't care about my susties or my blackheads or anything. The, the, the general public just wants to see uh, a snake. They don't care. They want to see a big snake. So they're they're there for the big retics or something. But we educate them nonetheless whether they want to see the iguanas are the sun gazers. So it, it's just a really cool thing. That's also how we were able to fund everything we ever do. Right. Well, let's get into, from don uh, from donations part, so let's get into memberships, Jason. Um, what would a typical single adult membership cost for yearly uh, at, at the CHS? Uh, Twenty-five bucks a year, twenty-eight for families, and we end up losing money on this, the... Uh, Single fit the single person. I mean, that's we generate enough money that we do all of our grant programs and donation programs from Reptile Fest, and our membership actually cost us money. Uh, up up until I take it back. Up until this uh, about a year and a half ago, when we switched printers and somehow got a different deal on postage, but up until that point, it was actually costing us probably twenty five. Thirty cents a person per year above what the membership was to have them as members. So members having a bunch of members didn't do society any good for us, just because of the way we had our printing and our the CHS bulletin, and that the uh, the editor of the bulletin refused to drop the quality of the print of the publication down. So we were fine with that. We were making enough money. We've always had plenty right. of money there. So twenty five dollars between twenty five and thirty dollars. Um, yeah. You, I mean, that's not a bad membership, and, and you have access to pretty much everything. We have probably the biggest herp library available to the general, well, not the general public, to our membership, but it's probably the biggest herp library available out there to for people to take books from. Uh, that should be a huge benefit, but as we've already discussed, not many Nobody people read books, books anymore. But um, then also all, all of our field trips, we restrict our field trips to members only, uh, and that's the the zoo community still thinks the CHS is awesome, so we're able to get some really cool zoo trips in, and all of those, and, and that's to any society, anybody who's in a herb society, contact your local zoo and just say, hey, we're the herb society that's local. They don't even care who you are. If you say you're a herb society and you want to come look at their stuff, they're that's generally like a day off for the keepers. They have to walk you around the building. They have to show you around. They, they love to do it. It's a break from the norm. And, uh, and if you are also happen to be educated people 
it gives them a chance to talk to people who know what they're talking about. So again, it's a, it's a break from the norm. Right. So that's a yeah. huge thing I would say to any um, herb society out there. It's just contact your local zoo. Granted, many local zoos have less reptiles than most of us have in our collections, but um, <laughs> the uh, you, you still get to get behind the scenes and talk to the keepers and see what's going on there. So it's a cool, it's a cool thing. It's really cool for the kids too. Great. Now the juniors. Now you have the Junior Herb Society. Do they have a membership too, or are they um, free underneath an adult membership? Um, Again, to have for them to do any of our field trips, they have to be members, and it's the same twenty-five and twenty-eight. Um, and I know one of the kids saved up his own money to join. He, he had his allowance or whatever, and he wanted to join and be a member. I thought that was just cool as can be. Um, but yeah, the the juniors we we do charge them, uh, but they get a ton of benefits as well. Plus, we bring them. <laughs> we celebrate everybody's birthday and everything else, so they're all getting cupcakes every every meeting, every other meeting. They're getting a deal. <laughs> well, good. All right, let's jump over to Cat. Cat, um, what kind of what's the membership rates to join your local harp society? We do twenty an individual, thirty a family, and then fifteen a student. And if you join at our expo, that's twice a year. If you're a first time member. It's half off. Wow. Which is kind of a nice deal if you want to try it out and see for a year if you want to join or if you and whatnot. We used to do half off every year, but we figured if you've already joined and you like us, then just stick around and pay full price. Right. <laughs> you know it benefits it benefits everybody in the membership, so Exactly. Which and now, what does that include? Does that include trips? You know, any of the trips, or are the trips extra depending on where the they're trips at? Are extra. We do. We normally do one trip to the San Diego Zoo a year, and that's extra because we have to rent the bus and do everything like that with that. But I think it ends up working out only to be about seventy-five dollars a person for that trip, which isn't which isn't too bad for gas and everything for the day. Right. And then that includes our junior membership also. Great. Well, it sounds good. And then uh, let's jump over to Ryan. Ryan, what is uh, what is your cost for Madison uh, Herpological Society? It's pretty much the same. Uh, 25 bucks a person, or we do 40 for families. Um, students get 5 bucks off, so they're 20 bucks. Uh, and, and that, uh, and then yeah, that's pretty much it. We also have opportunities for schools to be members, um, but that kind of is more of a us working with them on a um, uh, how many presentations we give there a year type thing. So, um, but yeah, otherwise it's about the same, and it includes kind of the same things. I mean, uh, only members can go um, on our field herping outings, um, and we do two, two or three a year. Um, we go to some pretty awesome spots around Wisconsin, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, see some a pretty wide variety of animals, uh, reptiles and amphibians, and uh, it, it includes uh, our membership at card. We get little cards for everybody, and includes discounts at local pet stores. And a lot of times, when you go to the sh local shows, uh, if you show them that they're a herb society member, I know most of the vendors and breeders, and they'll give people discounts. Um, uh, what else? I mean, we do a ton of stuff. Um, most of the stuff we do is actually free to the public other than, uh, like I said, outings and stuff are members only. But most of the other stuff we try and, like, get everybody to. So um, membership is just kind of a way for people to support us, but they don't need to be a member to, to come to meetings and things like that. Right, right. Now, I know Jason, he had mentioned that you, you guys had, you know, Chicago had a publication. Now, does that publication come out monthly? And then I'm going to ask the rest of the other panelists, too. Do you guys release a publication, and whether it's monthly, bi-monthly, annual? Yeah, ours is monthly, um, and it's we just started doing color photos on the cover. Um, we're trying to get fully co color, but that's going to be way, way more money. So uh, it, it is, but it is a monthly publication. It's uh, pretty well, pretty well known and. 
pretty cool thing to see your name in every month when they, they you know they print up the uh, the monthly minutes next to some really cool articles. Right. Well, great. And then, uh, Kat, do you guys have a monthly publication, bi-monthly, annual? Uh, we do a monthly, the Rattler. It's uh, email, except for a few members that prefer to have it mailed out to them. That's a great way to uh, get people to the meetings is make them pick up their publication at the meeting <laughs> instead of having it mailed. Um, and Ryan, what about you? Do you guys have a, a monthly publication? Yep, the uh, MAHS Insider comes out quarterly. Um, it's articles written by uh, local people. Uh, we do interviews with readers from all over the country. Um, basically, a lot of things that we talk about, um, care sheets, things like that, but also um, herpetologists that work in the field write articles. And It's a lot of the local people that kind of just add to this, um, and that goes out electronically. We just P we make a PDF, and that's an email that out to, to the masses. So... Um, that just kind of goes out to everybody that we can get it to. So, awesome, awesome, John. You, uh, you want to go ahead and take care of the next question? All right. And uh, so we've got the publications covered, and you've already gone over the junior members. Now, <clears throat> let's see here. As far as uh, where do you guys see herb societies in the next, say, ten, twenty, or thirty years, looking down the road? And let's start with uh, Chris again. Oh, there we go. Bulletin of Chicago Herpological Society. There you go, Jason. There's an old one for you. <laughs> uh, 20 to 30 years from now, that's a, that's a big stretch, to be honest. Um, I mean, I would love to say that I see them uh, really expanding and, and improving and actually gaining a larger audience and uh, membership base. Um I guess it all depends on those who are running it and how much effort they put into trying to gain members and developing programs and initiatives that help gain their interest. Um, that's one of the things. Uh, Jason and I uh, spoke briefly a couple um, several days ago uh, about some ideas for down here. I would love to see every state adopt uh, a program, an annual um, event like Reptile Fest where this um, event is just purely educational. Uh, there's no sales. There's nobody sitting there trying to shove a ball python down your throat and telling you, hey, look at this deli cup that its native habitat is. Um, it's just a bunch of people that yeah, um, want to share their knowledge and passion with others. And I would like to see every state adopt a program like that. I would just, I would love to see more people reach out and just try to educate others and not trying to sell them something. I, I don't get me wrong. I, I completely understand people need to make a living, and you know we need to try to support ourselves and our facilities and such. And obviously, I have nothing against that. But there's also nothing wrong with giving back and trying to just try to help our future. Um, we can't state that we are going to be around or her pediculture in general is going to be around for much longer if we don't get our boots on the ground and start putting in some work to try to change the minds and hearts of people towards these animals, trying to show politicians that these animals are not the evil beast that everybody's making them out to be and, that, and demonstrating that we can provide for these animals properly in captivity and offer them an excellent quality of life and contribute to conservation and education globally. Very definitely. Now, Cap, as far as you're uh, being one of the relatively new, newer people to the uh, reptile realm, as it were, where do you see us in the next 10 to 20 years? God, I hope moving forward, but if they keep pushing <laughs> these laws on us, we're going to be screwed if no one stands up and fights. <laughs> Um, just, uh, I, I'm lucky because I have Kim and Ken here that have helped foster and show me the way and whatnot. And I, I, what he was talking about would be awesome because, like I said, I just got back from IHS, the um, International Herpetological Symposium, and that was just amazing. And everything that I got to learn and meet everyone and see everything and do that. But I would like to see just the herp societies grow and. Just the communication and meeting so much because I went to the San Diego Super Show just before that and I'd asked someone, are you going to go? And they looked at me and go, no, I would never be caught there. IHS is too clicky for me. 
And I looked at him, I'm like, we're all in this together. This is something that we need to be together for, not stand apart. If we have that attitude, then we're going to get nowhere. And I just walked away from him because I'm going, he knows who I am and he knows where I work for. And Ken's the president of this of, of IHS. And he knows exactly I'm, what I do and where I stand with everything, you know. Right, right. And I'm going, if you're going to have that attitude, don't don't bother, but I would love to see us just grow and get to the point where I could turn around and call anyone and be like, hey, I need help with this. Can you call me and just do this? Or can you help me with that? And be able to go, hey, let's go to the Herp Society meeting in the next town and let's let's communicate together and do this and do that because we this is our 20th year. We want to have a big go out with a bang in December. December's our big month. Uh, December's our big raffle every year. Mm-hmm. We do the biggest thing at the end of the year, and we want to have a huge speaker come out. And I'd like to call, you know, the um, Arizona Herp Society, the Northern Nevada Herp Society, Eschar in California, and get all of them able to come out and just go out with a huge meeting at the end of the year. And I'd like to be able to do that every month, be able to at least two, three times a year and get huge meetings and be able to get all those people together and communicate and just make it a huge community and not have that clicky environment as I was told. Right, for sure. You know, and that's something that really bothers me too is like you said, the divisive mentality of a lot of keepers, you know, that they're stuck in one group or stuck in this group. It's like, do you own a reptile? Then you're not in the group. You're in a giant family. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, so Jason, what's your uh, what's your take on this uh, outlook in the next ten years here for uh, herb societies, as it were? Um, well, I want to just touch on the whole clicky thing. I, I heard that about the CHS when I first got up here as well, and that's and I've heard about the symposiums as well. You know, it's too clicky. Um, any of the symposiums, the Midwest has there's a Midwest herb symposium. Uh, that's going on shortly in Indiana up here, up in uh, the central U.S. That's going to be a great time. You get to see eight or nine speakers come in for that. And the international is one that, you know, it's one of those ones that's really you should be making. Um, but, yeah, the I as far as the question, um, I, I think it's with all the laws, it's kind of forcing people to, look around them to see where they can join up and be with people like-minded to fight these things. So there's like a, a strange benefit to these laws that we're going to get, um, we're going to get people coming in because of this, but I, I just don't see enough people joining these, uh, joining local societies that should be. I mean, the, the biggest breeders of every area should be in these societies, and you just don't you don't normally see that, and that kind of bugs me. I don't know why the breeders don't get out there and, and join or run or be on the board of these societies. And they want, a lot of these people want to complain about what's going on with the societies, <laughs> but they don't join them. They don't get out there and do the work. They don't join the board and do something there. So it, it's hopefully it'll it'll continue to improve and get better. I'm looking at just doing the, the juniors down here. If I start anything, just I think, the like I said earlier, the kids are easier to deal with and work with, and they're, you, you'll see more positive out of your energy that you put in with the kids. But hopefully, if I can get a thing going here with kids, and hopefully in 10 years those kids are old enough and passionate enough still that they can run something better, make it a, a better society in this area for for other herb keepers. For sure. Now, Ryan, same question to you, sir. Where do you see us in the, in the next decade or so? Oh, man, there's a lot of potential. <laughs> this could go. Um, I do agree with Jason. I love our kids' herb society. I really think that that's an important thing that every herb society should be focusing on is the future of where we want to be, um, and that comes with the kids. But... Uh, there's a few things I think that need to change in order for this to be a positive outcome. 
One of them being this sluggish, someone else will fix it for me mentality that everyone seems to have. Um, it's one thing that I absolutely hate uh, with any organization is it, you, you like trying to get membership out, trying to get people to come up and want to join together. I mean, that's something that people have got to shake off and they've got to want to stand up and go do something um, and be part of something. You can't sit in your house behind a computer all day and expect to be part of anything, you know. Um, and that's too many people are going that way. Um, you know, if, if that changed, I think they continue to grow. And I think that the, the, the big point is to keep working on the kids and the community. I mean, trying to get out there. I mean, it, it really depends. The future of Herb Societies depends on the Herb Societies and how, where the, what they're doing now. Um, you know, there used to be five of them in Wisconsin. Uh, one of them now is like three guys that have a beer in their basement and talk about snakes. That's about it. Um, so obviously they're not going to go anywhere. Nothing's going to happen. Um, it's just about, I guess, what we do now and getting out there and being dedicated and educating the public and educating kids and trying to make a positive difference and, 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 and understanding the difference between, you know, a real community and an online, you know, community of people and actually standing up to be heard and make a difference. And then, and I think her societies can potentially have a massive part of that of bringing their local communities together and talking to each other and, and to fight things nationally too. So but we'll have to see, man, but it all comes down to what we do today. Gotcha. Fair enough. Now, as far as um, you guys all talked about the kids and uh, getting them involved, do you folks see any impact on the parents when you do that? In other words, do you see the parents maybe lightening up a little bit as far as, you know, little Johnny owning a reptile? Or are they still just like, no, reptiles, stay away from me. Gross. Uh, anyone, uh, we'll start with Ryan on that one. Uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of parents that I find don't like, may not like the reptiles, but their kid does. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you know what, you send them to me once a month. And I'll bring reptiles for them to play with, and they don't have to bring them home. Yeah. And they can still push that passion and that, 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 that excitement about animals. And the parents kind of get on board with that. But once the kid gets involved and starts to learn and bring home books and starts doing – we make kids do a, a report, uh, a, an assignment every month. At the end of every meeting, they have to do some assignment. Um, we did a meeting about camouflage and how animals change – you know, chameleons change color and mossy geckos blend in and – at the end, they had to draw a picture of their favorite animal, reptile or not, <coughs> in camouflage in its native habitat. Um, and when they see their kids doing learning and educating themselves and, and researching and they find the value in that, it's a lot of parents, almost every single one, uh, has come around to the possibility of their kid having one of those animals uh, in their home because they see the dedication they have. And, you know, I've had, <laughs> I love it when a kid, one of our kids, Herb Society members, is sitting there, and the kid's sitting there, and the parent says something like, oh, that snake's venomous, or that snake's poisonous, and the, you know, five-year-old kid goes, mom, it's venomous, not poisonous. You know, so, you know, stuff like that. I love it. It's it's awesome. Um, and I think the parents kind of honestly respect that out of their kids, that they're taking that time to learn, and, 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 and that excitement, and they see it, and it kind of, whether they like it or not, they end up kind of learning themselves, you know. And I think most of the fears that we find with adults or kids or anything is it's just it's lack of knowledge. You know, as soon as you educate somebody a little bit, they usually turn around. Exactly. Now, Chris, have you found any uh, impact as far as when you are working with the kids, making an impact on the parents later on? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, when the parents, especially good parents, you know, yeah, you're going to have uh, you know some parents that just – they're not going to ever be able to get over their own fear enough to allow their kids to be able to expand, you know, their own love for what they find interest in. And that's a real shame. But I'll tell you what, the good parents, even if they're hesitant at first, once they see that their kid has, has begun this journey into learning about these animals and they're finding passion in it, they will come around to start being open to, you know, allowing their kid to maybe start with a little gecko or something like that. Um, at, what I see most of that in is doing birthday parties, um, and that's one of the things that's been nice. Most of these kids, their parents won't let them have one in the house, but 
because it was their birthday and because their kid, you know, is either a big fan of either the Python hunters or something like that on TV, uh, they want somebody to come in and bring some cool animals for them for their birthday celebration. And when you that kid gets the, that opportunity and their eyes light up and they get to play with all these different animals and hold them and see them up close, then their parents kind of pull me aside later on like, well, you know, we've always been hesitant about this, but... Uh, we're we're considering getting her or him a pet snake or a pet lizard or something like that. What would you recommend? Where can we get it from? And that gives me an opportunity right there to actually speak with the you know, with the parents directly, give them resources, tell them where to start, rather than leaving them to their own devices and then maybe doing a Google search and then going, oh, there's supposed to be a reptile expo, you know, next month, and we'll go to, the, to that and get a kit and get a, a snake for them. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that getting, you know, getting started at a reptile expo is necessarily a bad thing, but I think it ultimately depends on the dealer at, you know, that's, you know, whoever you end up with. Uh, that's where a lot of it comes down to, to be honest with you. Yes, there are some great dealers out there that, that I've met that really try to go above and beyond to make sure that uh, the, the purchaser has either A, done their research or you know, if they're buying it for their child, that the, uh, that the parents have done their research and understand what they're getting into and make sure that they have everything set up appropriately for the animal. Um, but then, of course, we all know that there's just some that honestly, quite frankly, don't care in the least and they're just going to, oh, you got 35 bucks? Well, here's a ball python. No problem. Have a good day. Um, and this is a big concern for me. Uh, that has been one of my biggest concerns with the, with the uh, reptile industry in general is walking by and seeing you know some of these people interacting exactly that way with new people that are uh, coming into the hobby. Um, we want them to be prepared. We want them to be knowledgeable about what type of animals they're going to be keeping because if we don't start them off right, then... It, it, let's say this kid, you know, he gets starts keeping this ball python. He's not set up properly, and the ball python dies. What ends up happening now? That kid now has kind of a distaste for keeping reptiles. Oh, you can't keep them. It, you know, it's almost impossible to keep these things alive, and it has nothing to do with the impossibility of keeping them alive, and everything to do with the resources that they had at their disposal in order to give them an opportunity to learn how to care for it properly. But at the same time, they're not necessarily going to look at it that way. We very well have just ended up creating an enemy later on down the line because, you know, as a kid, he didn't have very much luck in keeping, you know, his animals alive. We want them to be prepared. We want them to be knowledgeable in what they're keeping, and we want them to enjoy keeping it because that is what instills and builds that passion that is going to be the driving force, uh, keeping herpeticulture alive and well, you know, 10, you know, years, 20 years, 30 years from now, hopefully much, much longer than that. Very cool. Very true, too. Unfortunately, a lot of people are in it for, you know, like you said, just handing out the ball python at the first drop of 35 bucks and sayonara, there you go, don't call me. That's, Absolutely. That's nothing new, though. That was happening with corn snakes many, many years ago. So, you know, to blame it on the ball python... No, we saw it. We saw it 30 years ago with corn snakes. At, no, no, no. Uh, I didn't mean to make it sound like we was. But, you know, no, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm just comparing that. You know, that isn't something new that we've seen. Years ago, you know, that corn snake wasn't the $10 or $5 disposable pet that you know we may see nowadays because there, you know, other ones are bred in so much, so many numbers, this and that and whatever. But We've seen that in uh, her pediculture many years ago as well. At least I have, and um, I don't think that'll ever stop. As long as you know the big breeders and people think they can make money off of doing it, it'll never stop. And um, to to Florida just had a huge crackdown last year on people selling snakes on Craigslist without a license. I think that's great. The state, you have to be licensed and have a permit to sell snakes in Florida. Um, if you don't have it, you ought to, you, you know, you ought to pay that big fine. Um, I think that that's one way that we could kind of police ourselves in, in, in keeping that dis, disposable pet type th uh, attitude down and um, confronting. And I've seen this at shows too is good breeders confronting 
those bad apples and actually getting them kicked out of the show. Um, I think that's a great a great thing. And we actually had a guest on Reptile Show's Do's and Don'ts. Um, Terry Herrig actually did that at one of his shows because of that. And, and I think that's great. And I think the, the show promoters should actually promote that as well. Um, so, I mean, going forward, I mean, all of our panelists have great views, awesome views. Can we all blend together and continue to get everybody on the same page that that's the tough question and that'll be seen in years to come because you know we're all you know everybody here on this panel is on the same page but the extra 150,000 that are out there or the 100,000 that are watching or the 50,000 that are watching are they on the same page are they believing that this is the way it is and uh Jason made a great point earlier for me was the breeders aren't even part of the herb societies. And I think that should be number one, they should be part of the herb society. You know, they should be able to vote on the board. They should be part of their local herb society and help fund their local herb society because that's what's going to continue keeping them in business and, and, and make them, you know, a local person for, for animals and, and pet shops to go to. Um, I know in recent years, and I'm going to ask um, Chris this, to, uh, this too, but I know in recent years we've seen pet shops with less knowledge kind of close up, but there's still a lot of pet shops out there uh, out there with no knowledge to the animals that, are, that they are selling. Is anybody on the panel, and I'll start with Chris, is anybody on the panel doing something and trying to work with these pet shops that, that are selling these animals that don't have knowledge? Um, I would say yes. Um, I, I can say firsthand that uh, myself and uh, my buddy Brandon out in California, um, he, in fact, uh, just to give you an example, uh, Petco out there, um, a woman had contacted him and she was showing some uh, some serious concern for I can't remember the species in question here to be honest, but uh, she was showing some concern about some of the reptiles that uh, they were selling. Uh, she said that they were looked very dehydrated, uh, rather sickly, poor sheds, things like that on the animals, and asked if he would go and check them out since he was fairly local. And um, he did. He went in and he noticed that they was in very very poor shape. He made a phone call to the district manager of that location and said, look, you know, this is unacceptable. This is something that we, we need to change. And he uh, met up with the district manager at that location, addressed all the husbandry concerns, and explained why this is bad, why it's not good for the animals nor the people buying them, and explained, you know, how that's, you know, A, could potentially hurt their business. You have to put it to them in their terms, you know, how, you know, demonstrate to them that they could be losing money by their improper husbandry practices and not providing uh, the resources and knowledge uh, to their customers that they should be when it comes to the care of these animals. Um, and they did. He made some changes. Uh, I have a, uh, a um, pet supermarket that's not too far from me. And every once in a while, when you know the basking bulbs burn out, you got to go in to replace them. And you know, as I go in there, I um, I saw a couple of uh, their snakes, ball python specifically, dry sheds, etc. They didn't look too bad, other than that. But I had to have a talk with the store manager, and he, after I explained to him, you know, that that's not how a snake is supposed to shed, uh, he realized, oh, well, I, we didn't know. You know, of course, to us, we're like, how do you not know this? This is just common knowledge, you know, in snake husbandry here. But um, I still was able to discuss, you know, proper husbandry of ball pythons with them, pointed to a, uh, pointed them to a couple of different resources. And uh, now when I go in there, he does, he has them set up properly, and things are, are looking much better in there. We have to be willing to step up. Um, and don't get me wrong we're going to piss off a lot of people in the process of doing that, you know, it, and that just kind of comes with the territory. But if we really want to make changes, uh, we are going to have to basically be willing to step up and we're going to upset a few people. As long as you know that what you're doing is right and you're doing it for the welfare of the animals and you're doing it for the betterment of the community, I don't see what's wrong with that. And yes, go into that store, talk with the manager, be respectful, of course, 
but demand to see some changes. And if you have to go over the store manager's head and go with a district manager or something, then do it. But keep pushing until you start making changes because ultimately it looks better on us. It looks, but it does. It's it's and well, I shouldn't have even said it that way because to be honest with you, it should be about the animals and making sure that they are getting the proper care that they deserve and need. Uh, they did, They don't ask to be in this situation. They don't ask to be sold by us. They don't ask to be bred by us. Therefore, it is our responsibility to make sure that they are getting the good quality of life that they absolutely uh, deserve, and. In doing so, we need to make sure that all others are trying their best to make sure that the animals are properly cared for as well. Right. Great. Um, what about you, Jason? Have you walked in a, a pet store and, and let them have it besides the, the bird lady at, at the local flea market? Um, I I think like most big uh, kind of serious herpers, I don't really go to many pet stores. You know, I get all my rodents direct and everything else direct, so I don't spend that much time. But um, years ago, I, I used to <laughs> – I was such a pain in the ass that when I walked in the store, if there was any questions about reptiles, the salespeople would go, go ask him. And I would do all the sales for him, do the setups, and I, I had no problem helping him out. And I probably had better sales record than most of their sales guys there um, because I have a passion for the animals, and most of those guys didn't. Uh, but recently I just haven't been in enough of them, and I think that is part of the problem is that the serious herp community doesn't spend a lot of time in most pet stores. Um, there's, you know, there's the, the Chicago Reptile House, the Ben Siegel's, the uh, Ken's Place out in uh, Las Vegas that are a bigger, more serious pet store. You know, I'm not talking about the pet stores that have vision cages around the, the building and, and proper setups. I'm talking about your, your Petco, PetSmart, Pet Supermarket, Mom and Pops. We got fish, birds, and dogs, and, and iguana. We don't go into those, and those, are, I think, are the ones that need the most help. But I think most of the community just gets really tired of walking in there and just <coughs> seeing the same garbage all the time. And I, I, I have a hard time doing it myself anymore. Now that I'm back in Florida, it's a little bit different, though, because there's um, pet stores down here tend to get a little bit more oddball species sometimes that the wholesale is just like, oh, I'll throw this in, and they'll just you know keep it till, they, till it dies, and I'll never sell, but I'll throw this in just to make them feel like I gave them something special or something. And you see some weird stuff in stores down here uh, that I never saw up in Chicago or anything. Right, right. And Kat, on to you. Um, do you totally guys? Question. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, well, we had um, we only have about four small pet stores here in town, and one of them did get shut down this last year. Um, the snake shop. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. <laughs> You're shaking your head. Yeah. I've heard yeah. of it. Yeah. If you've heard of it, you can only imagine walking into it and seeing it. Um, I heard it wasn't yeah. pretty. Never had the best conditions if you walked into it in the last couple of years with the animals. And and they're still not sure of how it got... <laughs> oh. On um, how it got shut down. There was rumors of animal control. There was rumors of whatnot. I've talked to animal control unofficially and apparently they didn't shut it down um, but someone bought it and has all of the animals that I, from what I have right now is that someone has bought all the animals and he's no longer in it and whatnot <laughs> and other than that like we have reptiles and reefs and there's this other one glass habitats I've never been into because it's way on the other side of town and I mean like 20 minutes away and that's just too far for me to drive, <laughs> and I have exotic pets by, ran by Ken, and that's five minutes away, and right, it's right the street, <laughs> and that would be the obvious place for me to shop. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I keep chameleons, so I need uh, crickets like crazy. And the few times I've gone into Petco and PetSmart. I've walked in there and argued with the manager because they had a blue iguana that was 
face down like on its deathbed and told them, look, this thing needs medical care. And I took a picture of it and I sent it into their manager, district manager, and he's like, no, I don't see a problem with it. And I'm like, really? Because I do. And the store manager, I brought him over and showed him, and he went and picked it up, and the thing ran away. He goes, oh, look, it, look, it ran away. And I'm like, yeah, it's scared. Take it over to the, the vet that... It's right over the hill. You take it to Creature Comforts because I know what man or what store they took it to. Because my friend's the vet tech at the the um, veterinarian they use, so I knew where they take it. I was like, take it there and get it checked out. The thing's dehydrated. It's skin and bones. It needs help. No, it's fine. It got up and ran. Yeah, if it's moving, it's okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well. Can you at least sell it to me for half price or something? I'll take it home. I have no urge to ever own an iguana like that. Those things are huge, but I'll take it home. Rehab it and donate it to the Herb Society. Do something. No, it's full price. All right. Yeah, and, and you know, that's a pretty big corporation. And I think, you know, they have stores pretty much where every Herpetological Society is actually have a, a foot in the ground. Um I wonder if there's any way that, you know, any of their salespeople that, you know, maybe you can form a, a, a way that, you know, if you're going to sell reptiles in Petco or whatever, you know, you ha have to at least go to a her uh, herpetological meeting, meet some of the people, gather some knowledge, and, and gather friendships that would not only help out the company, but would also help out the actual salesperson because from what I find out, Talking with the salespeople, they're very well not educated on what they're supposed to be educated on. It only takes that special person with the passion to actually, you know, self-educate themselves to help sell. And typically, they don't work at Petco's or PetSmart's or uh, pet supermarkets. Now, over to Ryan. I mean, is there any way that we could actually maybe correlate uh, herpetological societies in with pet shops and try to build relationships and help them out and have you ever done that with any of the pet shops locally with you oh uh, yeah actually um there's a pet store here animart it's one of our sponsors they're a small pet store only two lo locations local um we know and have talked to every single person that works in the reptile department um most of them end up being part of the herb society um and it, you know it's it, other than that we've got uh Petco's that we've worked with them on doing um, reptile education type days where we come in and we bring a bunch of animals and no sales and we just bring in animals and talk about them. Um, we're doing the same thing now every single month with uh, PetSmart. We're going into the local PetSmarts every single month um, for a day on a Saturday and just setting up displays and setting up her society stuff and, and answering questions and letting people handle stuff. and um, You know, that just in order to do that, we just had to do... <laughs> A lot of paperwork with them and a lot of, you know, pushing to get them to want to do that. Um, just because, you know, they, I think the big box stores, one thing that, like you said, about how other people don't really know anything that worked there unless they have a passion for it. And that's really true, especially in the big box stores. But you got to remember, most of those jobs are like minimum wage and they have every person that works there works every single section. So the same person that sells you a gecko one day is going to be selling you a fish the next day and a hamster the next day and dog food the next day. Um, a lot of those places don't put people in specialized areas, um, so there's just no way for them to know what we do. Um, granted, I don't think that's a great excuse for... Uh, I was at a place today that had a... I stopped in to look at see if they had a special kind of bedding I wanted to pick up, and they had a, a fire skink on Eco Earth that was so wet it was like swamped and fire skinks are real dry, arid skinks. Um, <laughs> and it was like swampy bacteria nasty. So, you know, there's always stuff like that. I went into the same one, and they had uh, they had Chinese, Chinese water dragons in with crested geckos. And I asked them, you know, why, they try and why they're feeding them such expensive food. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it really just comes down to just pulling people aside, not being afraid to say something. Um, and, and working with them, giving an opportunity. We've even started looking at, uh, we'll be doing some um, programs for people that are working at stores, and we'll also be doing programs with firefighters coming up in the next year. 
um, and educating firefighters on if they come into a house that has snakes, how do they deal with it and get them out. Um, you just you really have to just take the effort to build those programs and then reach out and push them. Nice. Nice. That's a, uh, that's a great way of looking at it. And I'm glad our, all our panelists actually have outreach and are part of herpetological societies. And uh, it's great to have every single one of you guys around. Um, Chris, Jason, Kat, Ryan, I appreciate everybody coming on the show. Um, so in, in closing, all I have to say is all of the audience, find your local herb society. At least go to a meeting contact them. Any of the panelists, if you live close, just check over on the side or down at the bottom. I have all the links there, or the links are actually on the event pages. You can find their links. Go to them, send them an email, say you want to come to a meeting. They'll be willing to help you out. And thanks again, guys, for coming on the show. And we're going to close this out. Next week, we have David from David's Fine Geckos because it is Lizard World Day. So it's going to be all lizards next week, so make sure you join us next week, same time, 9 o'clock, right here on G Plus and YouTube. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks much.